Hey there. Um, I am just now finishing my spring semester and so um, I have a little bit more time to make videos and um, really most of what I was working on this past semester was um, more historical rather than theological. Um, so I wanted to share something uh, with you that I wrote about uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin um, who I find really just endlessly fascinating um, and so I might end up making a couple videos about him um, just because there's so much to explore really so um, <clears throat> what I've written for him really looks more so at his life and his works and sort of the um, um, greater situation surrounding his um, his life uh, with the Catholic Church um, and its influences um, and sort of um, silencing of his work um, but I would like to make other videos that get into um, more so his own personal theology uh, because I find it really so interesting with him that he didn't really want to be seen um, as somebody who's really writing metaphysical treaties um, but more so scientific treaties um, and so it enters into this um, strange area when we analyze it um, where these works should be analyzed theologically and metaphysically um, <clears throat> rather than from a uh, strictly scientific um, outlook. So there's a lot there to unpack, um, but I'm just going to be talking today um, sort of about his life and Teilhard the Man. So I'll go ahead and start reading. Uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a man decades ahead of his time. Um, an ordained Jesuit priest, Teilhard uh, was also a philosopher and paleontologist, best known for his blend of evolutionary science and theology. Uh, because of his deeply mystical writing, he was admonished by the Roman Catholic Church and also by his Jesuit order. Uh, however, his faith did not waver in these warnings. So Teilhard was deeply influenced by Charles Darwin's, <clears throat> excuse me, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. And so Teilhard's own writings reflect a sort of evolution of man in regard to a universal Christ um, and a cosmic net consciousness. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, he also found influence in early church figures such as Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, um, which is a key for Teilhard's universalism, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and Ignatius of Loyola, who's the founder of the Jesuit order and also a prolific missionary, um, which would inspire Teilhard's own world travels, as you'll see. So in a beautiful blending of science and theology, Teilhard writes, Someday, after mastering the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love, and then, for a second time in history of the world, Man will have discovered fire. I think that's such a good quote. So a little bit about uh, Teilhard. Um, <clears throat> Teilhard de Chardin was born in Sarcenat, uh, France in 1881 uh, and was the son of a farmer uh, who had an interest in science himself. So this interest in science carried on to his son, Teilhard, uh, and came to inform Teilhard's faith and, uh, and life's work as well. Um, so Teilhard attended a Jesuit boarding school as a child, went on to become a Jesuit novitiate, and at 18 um, was ordained, uh, so in 1911. Um, during World War I, Teilhard uh, chose to serve as a stretcher bearer rather than a front lines or hospital chaplain, uh, and his bravery during the war effort was awarded, awarded national recognition. So after the war, he taught at the Catholic Institute of Paris in the fields of paleontology and geology. He went on to take part in many scientific expeditions across the globe um, and was part of the discovery of the Peking man's skull. Um, so he spent a lot of time in China. Um, this discovery was significant as the Peking man represented a previously unknown step in humanity's uh, common evolutionary journey. So during World War II, he spent several years in a sort of um, diplomatic captivity in Beijing, under, uh, which was under Japanese occupation. Um, so most of Teilhard's work was really scientific in nature uh, when you look at his entire oeuvre. Um, but his attempts to combine theology, philosophy, and evolutionary science are most well known uh, at this time. So he struggled to publish his philosophical works, and publication was forbidden by the Jesuit order as well during his time. Um, he was silenced, and he was also um, essentially sent into exile in China because of his writing um, and his beliefs on them, uh, on original sin, essentially. Um, so due to the objections of his work by the church, um, his theological writings were not published widely until the 1950s um, and after his death, um, more exclusively, in, in 1955, which was when he died. Um, so his work received sharp criticism and suppression from the Roman Catholic Church, basically for his entire life. Um, and in 1962, posthumously, um, the Holy Office issued a warning against uh, viewing his work in an uncritical manner. However, it was his work was being published at this time. Um, so... 
during his life, um, his devotion to Christianity was not in question. Um, more so, he was writing what could be perceived as, as heterodox writings, I guess. Um, so I'm going to look in this video really at, um, at his incredible theological and philosophical theses, um, which are evolutionary and metaphysical in nature. Though I caution you, um, he did not really want these to be perceived as metaphysical. However, that's where we're reading them uh, now. So a little bit of greater historical context to uh, Teilhard's life. Um, so Teilhard de Chardin's life spanned uh, the late 18th, 19th century through the mid 20th century, um, which is really, as you know, an incredible time um, that represented both world shaking loss through two world wars and also incredible gains in science and technology. Um, and really his life was um, uh, sandwiched right between um, the, the two Vatican councils as well. So as mentioned, Teilhard was personally touched by both world wars. In the first war, he was a stretcher bearer. Um, and in the second war, he lived um, in, in China for six years. Um, so essentially, he was a captive, um, sort of a, a diplomatic captive, um, because he was a foreigner um, in Beijing under Japanese occupation. Um, and also, there was this ordered exile from the church. Um, he really, uh, he did not have freedom of movement during this time to leave the country. So Teilhard's time in China came to greatly influence his thought, not just in regard to paleontology, but philosophy and religion as well. Um, so it can be said that the greatest influence um, is the exposure to Eastern religiosity and how it came to inform Teilhard's own view of the Christian faith. Um, so it's important to know, like, especially with the Jesuit order, um, they were already, they had already been in China. Um, however, China had strict controls over who could come into the country at certain times, specifically with missionaries. So in 1939, while Teilhard was living in China, Pope Pius um, VII reverted a policy and allowed Catholics in China to practice Confucianism uh, alongside uh, Christianity. Um, and this opened the door to a flourishing of Catholicism in China. Um, so his time in China also called him to consider the views of race um, and of being an outsider himself, um, both through the discovery of the Peking, Peking, excuse me, Peking man uh, and Teilhard's own views of uh, what he calls the common man, the everyman. Um, overall, he spent roughly 20 years of his life in China, working closely with Chinese scientists and intellectuals, and his sister also served as a missionary in China as well, and she died there. Um, so interestingly, after Teilhard left China for good during the revolution of 1949 and China, um, all foreign missionaries were expelled from the country. Um, <clears throat> so Teilhard's principal theory in regard to theology was evolutionary in nature, as I've explained. Um, so for him, the universe hinged upon an evolutionary process. Um, and this was, of course, informed in some manner by Charles Darwin um, and the Christian belief of a great chain of being sort of descending from the divine. Um, so in his book entitled uh, How I Believe, Teilhard lays out the tenets of his personal philosophy. I believe that the universe is in evolution. I believe that evolution proceeds toward the spiritual. I believe that the spiritual is fully realized in a form of personality. And I believe that the supremely personal is the universal Christ. And so, of course, one could draw parallels on the surface from Darwin to Teilhard. Uh, the, the theories diverge, really, as I'm going to show. Um, it was really just more of an influence um, on Teilhard scientifically. So during his lifetime, the sciences were making huge gains in knowledge in not just theories on evolution, but also special and general relativity, quantum mechanics, the Big Bang Theory was developed, um, the age of the solar system was determined, including, including the age of the Earth, uh, plate tectonics and the continental drift theory were uh, developed, and new geological methods were developed um, to better understand ancient climates. So all of these advances in science really touched on Teilhard's life, um, and they were made in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and, and so because he was a scientist, these, these new developments also came to um, inform his faith as well, and the concepts that he was um, trying to explain. So during Teilhard's lifetime, the Catholic Church struggled with the rising tide of secularization of the Western world and also persecution uh, due to social unrest, revolutions, and world wars. So additionally, Catholic missionaries in the Far East worked to improve education and healthcare in countries like China, Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. Um, the Jesuits, of which Teilhard was part of, are widely known for their missional work uh, throughout Asia. So Catholic uh, social teaching came to prominence in response to the condition of workers and um, living conditions through the um, Rerum Novarum and the um, Quadragesimo Anno, pardon me, uh, both were papal efforts to address uh, conflict and instability um, and also the Great Depression as well. So during World War II, the church was greatly criticized for the perceived silence in regard to Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Um, so there was, however, major European Catholic resistance to Nazism 
and many clergy members were also murdered by the Nazis um, during the war. So additionally, the Second Vatican Council occurred only a few years after Teilhard's death. Um, so again, his life was sandwiched between the two councils. Um, and so uh, the Second Council was a major undertaking of reform, essentially to modernize the Catholic Church. So a little bit about Teilhard's theories. Um, so Teilhard has an understanding that of Christ in relation to the evolutionary nature of the cosmos, um, which shows that the cosmic Christ is not only the source and sustainer of everything, but also the ultimate end goal of creation. Um, so his aim was for a new Christianity, one that was a blend of theology and science. So according to Teilhard, uh, this universe evolves, uh, driven and alert by the cosmic Christ, the motor of evolution, the sacred heart, the essence of all energy. Um, so Teilhard came to recognize the cosmic crisis was imminent and transcendent. Um, so immersed within the emerging universe, um, Christ guides the cosmos as it ascends from one critical point to another on its successive path toward integration and unification. So for him, the omega point was the final and greatest evolutionary point. Um, I'm going to put up a picture of um, the omega point right here so you can see the spiraling. Um, and so the Omega point was essentially the, the culmination, the, the universal culmination, um, the highest point where the material and human were finally reunited with the divine. Um, so this Omega point uh, for, is for Tehard the Lagos, um, which draws all things into himself through an upward ascent and consummation. This is a singularity. Um, when everything that exists, both animate and inanimate, uh, becomes one uh, with divinity. And then I'm going to try to get into this in, in other videos because that doesn't quite do it justice, honestly. Um, it's, it's very uh, interesting and Omega Point has been developed uh, further by um, theologians um, beyond Teilhard. So Teilhard's theological views were Christocentric in nature. That's absolutely key um, to understanding his theology. So Christ, says Teilhard, is the term of even the natural evolution of living beings. Evolution is holy. Uh, evolution, by revealing a summit to the world, makes Christ possible. Just as Christ, by giving sense, meaning, and direction to the world, makes evolution possible. So evolution helps us understand the cosmos and the cosmic Christ of St. John and St. Paul and the Church Fathers, without whom there would be no cosmos. Um, so according to J.A. Lyons, who wrote on the cosmic Christ of origin in Tehard, he writes, as the one who holds everything together, Christ exercises a supremacy over the universe, which is physical, not simply juridical. He is the unifying center of the universe and its goal. The function of holding all things together indicates that Christ is not only man and God, he also possesses a third nature, which is cosmic. Um, so <clears throat> the cosmic Christ happens through the incarnation and brings the eternal Christ into the material world. This Christ is the culmination point of humanity and the divine and is essentially the center or the radial of the universe. So it excludes nothing and no one. Again, animate and inanimate. Um, so I've touched on this in a prior video, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and include it here again. Um, the Indian theologian Paul D. Devanandan argued from Ephesians uh, chapter 1 verse 10 that cosmic Christ united all things to himself. This he claimed included non-Christians as well. So um, here we sort of see that uh, universalism thread um, for uh, Tehard. So we understand through Tehard's theology that he was informed by, as I said, the universalism of certain early patristic writers like Origen um, and Gregory of Nyssa um, and certain passages from the New Testament such as those from Ephesians and Colossians. So overall, Teilhard paints a picture of a universe that is continually evolving, evolving with a God um, that is hard at work to collect and guide. So um, the universe moves upward and towards um, final fulfillment, which is a reunion with God, and God directs the movement of the universe of which Christ is the radial center. Um, so you have to understand when you're considering Teilhard's theology that um, evolution was essentially the, the pinnacle point of science at the time. So while we might be moving away from um, evolutionary theories or exploring other ideas, um, this was essentially the cutting edge for his theology. And so it is a, a masterful attempt to blend science and theology. So applications for modern ministry. Despite suffering suppression by the Catholic Church during his life and posthumously, Teilhard has drawn much admiration for his work by scholars and mystics in equal measure. So Teilhard represents a unique attempt to blend religion and science, as he said, um, of which had not been seen in his lifetime. I mean, I'm, I'm serious, this was, this was a, a, a very unique mind. 
Um, additionally, Teilhard's overall message is positive in nature. The universe and humanity has a purpose, is moving in a direction, and God is guiding the purpose. So Teilhard was also unique um, in his life experience and education as a Jesuit priest and scientist who was able to travel the world and live through two world wars, um, and all of that came to inform his personal theology. So I feel that the most important application for modern ministry is Teilhard's brand of mysticism and also the style and approach to his missionary work. So according to Gervais Matthew, it is impossible to come to know Teilhard without being impressed both by the depth of his spiritual life and by the fact that it was poured into the traditional Ignatian mold. So even as an old man, he meditated during his retreats using the Ignatian composition of place. A favorite subject of his meditations was Christ walking on the water. And his repeated meditation on his own death seems clearly to be an echo from the exercise. He was the heir to the great Jesuit missionaries, De Nobilis, uh, who had lived as a Brahmin among Brahmins, Ricci, who had lived as a Mandarin among Mandarins, and like them, he was dynamized by a Christ-centered apostolate. I love that quote. So in his approach uh, to his faith and works, Tehard came to inspire many other mystics, um, one of which is Father Bede Griffiths, who I've made a video about in the past, um, who was a Benedictine monk who moved to India. Um, originally, his intentions were to start a missionary um, and to bring Christ to India, but upon his arrival, he realized that Christ was already there. Um, and so his views were radically changed by that, um, and also how he interacted with the individuals he was living among. This path eventually led him to become a Sanvasi, um, an Indian holy man, essentially dying to the world and becoming solely devoted to the service of the divine. So again, a monastic lifestyle, deeply monastic. Um, he believed that India allowed him to discover the other half of his soul. Um, and so he really worked to, uh, to unify spiritual beliefs of the East and the West. Um, and so Father Bede was deeply influenced by figures like C.S. Lewis, Carl Jung, Tehard, um, Sri Aurobindo, among others. So it's critical to understand that there was so much inner dialogue happening with these great minds that I've mentioned and many more. Um, these influences of Eastern belief systems, science, psychology, esotericism, um, all of this Christian mystics uh, were, were experiencing and, and were, were open to. And so there's so much inner dialogue that was happening that we often oversimplify. So it's important to, when you consider Tehard, to consider really a, a greater philosophical theological net. Um, of individuals that were involved in, in advancing these thoughts. Um, so in all, Tehard and those who were inspired by him moved Christianity forward in a way that better dialogued with other faiths and cultures, understanding humanity as having a common purpose uh, where we all are worthy and equal. All right, that's all I have today. Um, thanks so much for listening to this bit about Tehard, and I will um, probably be making some more videos in the future about the Omega Point. All right, take care.